Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My brothers and sisters, Ya Ali Madad. In the recent months, a microscopic particle that we have come to call COVID-19 has challenged our everyday reality. Many of us have faced great uncertainty or difficulty, and some of us have also lost loved ones. And yet we have found that we are no longer able to come together, not even for prayer or to participate in the last rites of those who have passed away. On the other hand, we also find that we have suddenly a lot more time available for reflection. And with everything that is happening, as we are reminded of the fragility of our own existence, or as we experience loss and hardship, or witness the difficulties of others, perhaps it is natural that we may begin to ask certain questions. Questions about how to make sense of the suffering in the world, or about the nature of Allah and our relationship with him. Now, for some, just the existence of suffering itself becomes a reason to doubt and to say that maybe there isn't a God after all, maybe Allah doesn't exist. But it's important to reflect on that, because by removing God, we don't actually remove the suffering, but we do remove the hope. We remove the hope that somehow, somewhere, there is a just and merciful creator who can take all of the apparent injustices and suffering and inequality and hardship and the rights and the wrongs of this world and bring it all together on his divine scales of justice and balance everything out with love and compassion. Instead, this life and this world becomes all that we have and we leave ourselves very much alone to face its challenges. But that is not our way. For one who believes there is an entirely different response to suffering and to hardship, which comes from a deeper understanding of our relationship with Allah and of the nature of the Creator. And in trying to understand the nature of Allah, one place that we can begin is by looking at the Asma'ul Husna, or the beautiful names of Allah, that he has chosen to represent himself and his qualities. And amongst these names, we find these most beautiful attributes, Al-Wadud, the loving, Al-Ghafur, the forgiving, Al-Adl, the just, As-Salam, the peace, As-Sabur, the patient, and of course, those two most emphasized qualities of Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, the compassionate and the merciful. Now, if we look at the teachings of our beloved Prophet, wasallam, our Prophet said that we ought not to only know these names as words, but in a hadith, he said, qualify yourselves with the qualities of your Lord. He is saying that we should, in fact, take these attributes and in the limited way that we can, with our human limitations, we ought to strive to embody these names, to become these names, so that that innermost nature of ourselves, that divine spark that we each have within us, has an opportunity to radiate outward into the world, so that not only us, but also those around us can have that glimpse of divine reality and divine love and compassion through our own conduct. And in order for us to really do that well, it's helpful to have a deeper understanding of what these names mean. And we will begin that exploration just by looking at two of them. The names are Rahman and are Rahim, which are evoked every single time we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and are at the very center of our understanding of the nature of the Creator. 
And if we look at these names, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, they're often translated as being compassionate and merciful. But if we look closer, we will see that in Arabic, both of these names share a single root word, Rahim. And if we take this root, we find another literal meaning, which refers to the womb of a mother. The womb of a mother. So what does that mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as his most emphasized qualities, is describing himself as being that kind of compassion and that kind of mercy that exists in a limited way in this world between a parent or a mother and her child. And he takes that for himself and uses our own human experience as a way of helping us to understand our relationship with him as being one of parenthood, of love, of guidance, of protection, of nurture, and yes, also of accountability, but always through love and through mercy, through rahmah because all of creation is born of the womb of the creator, of the rahmah, of the compassion of the creator. And in the Quran, in Surah 7, Ayah 156, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that know that everything is encompassed within my rahmah, my mercy encompasses everything. And when we know this deeply, then this knowledge can inform our response to suffering or difficulties in our lives. Sometimes we might find ourselves wondering whether the difficulties we encounter are in fact a form of punishment for us. And perhaps to an extent, that depends on our response to those difficulties. Because if in times of trouble, we find ourselves being able to turn to the Rahmah of the Creator, and find comfort and solace and strength in that relationship. If our trials bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then perhaps they are in fact blessings in disguise for us. But if our difficulties become doubts, and if those doubts then create a distance between us and Allah, then perhaps in those times we can still turn to him and pray for imanji, salamati, for strength of faith, so that inshallah we too will emerge as one of those who become closer to him through the difficulties that we face. If we look back into early Muslim history, we find that just some seven years after our beloved Prophet passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, there was a plague that arrived in the region of Amwas. This was the first plague that actually affected the Ummah. And what was significant about this plague is that a large number of the closest companions, the Sahaba of the Prophet, would ultimately be afflicted along with their families. But we can learn something from the way that they responded to this difficulty. One of the most loved companions of the Prophet was Mu'ad ibn Jabal. And Mu'ad accepted Islam as a young teenage boy. He was one of the few people that were appointed as a scribe to write down the revelation of Allah during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet. In fact, such was the caliber and status of Mu'ad that the Holy Prophet himself had said of Mu'ad that Mu'ad will be the one who will lead all of the scholars into paradise. When Mu'ad, now just some 33 years of age, heard about the plague and the number of close companions of the Prophet who had passed away, in lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun, how did he respond to that? He responded by saying, surely this is a rahmah, this is a mercy, from Allah and his position didn't change when he and his own family became affected. We are told that Muad turned to his son and asked him, how are you? 
And his young son responded with an ayah of the Qur'an, Surah 2, Ayah 147. And Mu'ad's son tells Mu'ad, Verily the truth is from Allah, so do not be amongst those who have doubt. And Mu'ad, smiling, responded to his son with another ayah, Surah 37, Ayah 102. And he says, Inshallah, in the words of the Quran, Inshallah, you will find me amongst the Sabirin, amongst those who are patient, who are content. It's perhaps helpful to remind ourselves that to pass away in Islam, to return back to Allah, is itself considered to be an act of divine mercy or rahmah. And it is for this reason, perhaps, that the one who has passed away is referred to as marhum or marhuma. And again, we find this word raham and rahma embodied in marhum and marhuma, which literally means the one who has received mercy, the one who has received rahma and returned to Allah, just as a child being reunited with his mother. And it is for this that we offer shukr. My brothers and sisters, in keeping with the guidance of our beloved Imam Zaman, let us remember in the weeks to come that however much happiness or sorrow this life brings us, it is but a short passage in eternity. And let us always have our sights set on that greater life and existence which is beyond this one. Let us recognize that whatever happens to us, however good or bad, is not nearly as important as how we respond. Because every situation gives us an opportunity to choose a response that either brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or creates a distance between us and him. So let us be mindful that as we are practicing our social distancing, that that, that practice doesn't extend to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Rumi who said that if we are bothered by every rub, how is it that we can be polished? And surely in every difficulty there is an opportunity for an inner polishing. So let us make the most of this opportunity, of this additional time that we have, to reinvigorate our relationships, our relationships with our family, our friends, the community in which we live, so that in these relationships we can consciously embody those divine qualities of love and compassion, of forgiveness and generosity, of kindness and of patience. And inshallah, we will also find strength and comfort in knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a perfect loving parent, would never leave us alone or forsaken, and that in the end, will always do for us what is good, inshallah. Ya Ali Madad.